I've just always been someone who can put one foot in front of the other. I remember running off the back of the, the helicopter and you know, it was the first time that I heard the crack and thump of a, of a round flying over your head. Life's short and life's even shorter when you're shooting bullets at each other. There's kind of RPGs flying over our head, machine gun fire. Energy's something we've all got, right? We're all giving off some sort of energy. I remember just running to this wall and just getting down behind this wall and we all just looked at each other and just went, well, this is it, isn't it? So my name is Jay Morton, uh, ex, ex Special Forces, ex SAS, and I come from Preston. Like, I wasn't really someone that got into trouble a lot, but I think, kind of looking back, I was just bored. I was just bored of the topics that were getting taught. I didn't really like school, and at the time, when you're a young kid, you don't understand why. Um, but it's literally that it's a, a lack of, of stimulation. And that transferred on to when I went to college after I left school. I went to study uh, sport and yeah, like again, like enjoyed playing sport, but like 90% of the time was sat in a classroom in a cage and you know, that's not where I'm supposed to be. So like quit after a, a year. Then I just got stuck in dead end jobs, working in factories and um, had a job making UPVC glass windows and a job uh, as a delivery driver um, and yeah that kind of sparked my interest in, into going into the military. Like I've always been into fitness or pushing myself like even as a kid like I was the one that was going out running when I was at school um, do you know I remember like my parents or I remember I bought you know for Christmas I, I wanted like the weights bench out of Argos right and the set of weights and I was like 13 years old just trying to get massive just doing everything completely wrong um, so like from an early age I've, I kind of I found comfort in pushing myself I think human beings are just pre-programmed to just take the easy option um, and the world we live in right now just gives so many options to be in like we live in a house right we don't have to feel the weather outside of the elements you know, there's no rain, like we've all got a warm bed to sleep in, we've all got cash in the bank, whether we work or not. Um, you walk down to the, the shops or get in your, your, your transport vehicle, your car, it's like, everything's easy, right? Like, life is set up to be easy. And um, so it's more about just, you know, it's by no one's fault that everyone just ends up living the easiest life that they possibly can and just, and you know that, that monotonous kind of life that everyone just seems to fit into, right? Leave school, get grades, go to college, get A-levels, study, go to university, um, and then get that nine to five job, like earn a load of cash, save up for your retirement, retire, have that mortgage and that car. And um, I don't know, it's like you've got to be able to pull away from that and try and understand why everyone's doing that. And everyone's doing it just because everyone else is doing it. And that's not a reason to be doing stuff. Um, so you've got to like say, well, what do I want in life? What do I want to do? And, you know, for me, the military gave me a, a lot of those answers because it was something completely different. And I think even just going to war or going to battle or being involved in combat, you know, you grow up in a different way and you get to see the world in a different way. I always thought that I wasn't set out for the normal life. Do you know, we have this vision of a normal life where you get up in the morning, you kiss your wife goodbye and wave goodbye to your kids and set off on your nine to five job on the trainer in the car and you work for those eight or nine hours during the day and then finish and then come home and go to bed and then repeat that. I don't know, like I always, I always kind of knew deep down that like that life would just not entertain me from the start. Even now, I think gut, gut, you know, that gut feeling or that gut instinct is, is generally how I navigate through life. Um, and you know, I think the more you do it and the more you actually follow that gut feeling and 
and listen to it, the more in tune you get to it. Um, but back then, you know, 16, 17 years old, it was, I don't know, like I, I've always had it in my, like I'm, I'm competitive, right? I've always wanted to, you know, secretly or, or whatever, just be better than the people around me. Cause I never, I guess I never had that growing up. Like I was quite a chunky kid and um, quite a shy kid. So I've always just had this, this thing that's followed me around. You know, I've always had this like vision of myself following me around that I'm just this shy, chunky kid that I was when I was younger. And I've always just tried to get away from that throughout my life. Like I was 19 years old turning up at basic training and you know, you know, I still had that like element of that fat shy kid that was like chasing me around. So like when I turned up, I remember turning up at the train station and um, I remember looking around at the other lads and just thinking like there's some, some big, big lads or but like, but everyone looks stronger and fitter than you or like more confident or, you know, you just have this perception of them and they're probably, you know, looking back now, they're doing exactly the same. They're looking at you going like, fuck, like these guys are stronger, fitter than me. I think it's just something that humans have got ingrained into them. turn up as a civilian, you know, wide-eyed, eager, get your head shaved and, and you leave as, as a soldier um, and it takes six months. I, I kind of shocked myself getting through that because I, I was never the fittest, like I was never the strongest, I was never at the front. Like, and we used to do these exercises where, you know, you, you'd be, it'd be a warm-up before we went on a tab and the PTIs would you know, point to a tree and just say, right, everyone to that tree and back, last, last 10 go again. And I'd always be in that last 10. Um, and then it'd be right, go again, last five go again. And I'd always be in that last five. But um, I kind of like, I had a, a bit of a theory around that. And um, I guess because I was never the fittest, never the strongest, but I've always completed stuff and always hung on. So I've always been used to being you know, in that fatigue state, like that's quite normal for me, which as we all know, that builds resilience and that builds a stronger mind and body. Whereas the, the front runners, they were just used to, you know, running at their normal pace and just being okay with that. Um, so, you know, when you deploy to places like the jungle or some of these harsher environments, like where everyone is on that level of fatigue, like for me, it was just normal. And you'd see some of the fittest people just fall over and you know collapse with heat stroke or you know just not be able to to carry on just because of the conditions do you know what like my head goes empty when you're in that dark place um i've just always been someone who can put one foot in front of the other and i think if you break down any mental or physical challenge it's just a case of progression and as long as you can keep that momentum and keep that progression going forward. You'll get to where you need to go. Have you ever had a point in time where you've obviously applied that method, one foot in front of the other, but you felt like me, I couldn't put that next foot in front of the other foot? No, no. I, like going back to, again, like I, I'm, in, I'm in my comfort zone when I'm, when I'm fatigued. So, you know that, I just know that I can just keep, you break it down right and it's just one step and then the next step's just one step. And just, you know, forget about where it is that you, you need to go and just concentrate on that next step. And like, the rest is just time and time moves right, time ticks down and then eventually you just find yourself in that position. You know, I joined the Paras, I was 19 years old deployed to Iraq, I was 20, deployed to Afghanistan in 2006, I was 21. And um, yeah, like we got involved in like heavy fighting pretty early on. And uh, like 21 years old, like all your mates are still doing the same thing that they're, they're doing back at home. And you grow up very quick. Um, it's a different kind of education. And then I, I think kind of 
you know, like you're full of testosterone when you're 21 years old, aren't you? And, you know, you, you almost, I don't know, you kind of want to be in battle, but at the same time, you don't want the bad, you don't want the, the negative aspects of it. Like, you, you don't want to see your mates die. Um, or anyone die for that reason on your side. Um, and I think the older you get, like, the more wise you get and the more you're able to, like, listen to your body and mind more and just, like, understand more about, I guess, what you want and where you fit into into combat. And and I guess, like, the, the further on, on in my career was more of just, like, seeing what human beings are just capable of doing to each other. Um... And again, you can look at that in like a really negative way, but I kind of, I looked at it as a positive and just, cause you know, life's short and life's even shorter when you're shooting bullets at each other. So it's like, to you know, there's, there's kids or whatever, or young people or all these people dying. And it's like, they're all living in this like hell hole kind of thing. And it was, um, for me, it was more about, you know, it taught me, it taught me more about just how I want to live my life outside of, of that area. And uh, understanding that life's short and you do, what, you do what you do to make you happy and you follow those things instead of, you know, what we say about like following that normal life dream. Energy is something we've all got, right? we're all giving off some sort of energy. You know, I call it drains and radiators. Like people are either a drain or they're a radiator. You know, you always know that drain when you're around that person. You generally come away feeling drained, right? That's what they do. They're negative people. They're the kind of people that make excuses for what they're doing, whether they're wearing the wrong boots or, you know, they've not had breakfast that morning. Yeah, they're, they're drains, right? And I think the more you're around those people, the more you feel it. Um, and then you've got radiators and radiate is radiate energy, right? You know a radiator, you know when you're around someone because they're, they're positive people. Um, they've always got your back. They've always got new ideas. They're always doing stuff. They're always wanting to move forward. And I think the more you can be around radiators and the less you can be around drains, like the better your energy is going to be, right? Positive mindset's important. Um, just seeing things in a positive way. You've only got to turn the, the media and news on now to be swarmed with negative and it's about you know surrounding yourself with good people um, having goals and ambitions um, and seeing every fuck up and failure is just a positive you know everything's there to to learn everything's put in front of you to learn from um, and it's how you view the world right if you view the world in a positive mindset then you're always going to be moving forward you're always going to be uh, creating and meeting good people. On that 2006 tour of Af Afghanistan, so the first time that I came under contact, we deployed to a place called Nauzad. We had a patrols platoon that, that were already stationed there, doing some recce stuff. And we literally landed on these, landed in these CH-47 helicopters. I remember running off the back of the, the helicopter and, you know, that was the first time that I heard the crack and thump of a, of a round flying over your head. And we'd just run into this massive scrap that the, uh, the patrols lads were in. So there's kind of RPGs flying over our head, machine gun fire. And we just looked at each other and just burst out in laughter. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I remember just running to this wall and just getting down behind this wall and we all just looked at each other and just went, well, this is it, isn't it? Like this is started. And that was a long day. Like, you know, I think we were in contact for say six to eight hours. And personally, I, you know, I think once you get over the, like once you get over the first reaction of the first round that's been fired and the first round that you've heard, the rest of it just all sounds, sounds the same. Like you're in that moment then. And the rest is just about thinking logically about 
how you combat that situation and how you get out of that situation. And like I've felt fear before in, in, in the past and yeah, like fear generally only happens for like a short period of time because there's usually a logical explana explanation that that you can put to why you're feeling that fear, whether it's a, a round that's just cracked over your head or something that's just exploded or you know maybe there's some rock fall on a mountain like that's a moment to be scared right but there's a logical explanation for it and there's usually an action that you can take which is going to get you out of that fear feeling and get you to some sort of safety so you've got to break it down that way i think kind of the things that that, that scare me more than than those dangerous kind of things are just you know like living a stagnant life or living a boring life um like boredom and mediocrity fit like scare me way more than than climbing Everest or being shot at and I think like I'd hate to just get to the age of like 80 or 90 years old or 100 and just turn back and just think that I've wasted time It can be quite intimidating when you first start because especially me, like I was 24 when I passed selection and like the rest of the guys in my troop were all, you know, late 30s, early 40s. They're all men. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's quite intimidating. And, you know, the sta they've already got high standards, right? They've been using all the kit and equipment and doing runouts way before I've turned up. So it's... You know, I've, I've now, like I've done a six month course, right, which is selection, but that doesn't mean that I'm a special forces soldier. Like that comes after, like when you start training with the teams, when you start learning different crafts. Selection is like a race of attrition and um, you generally start with around 150 to 170. In the first three weeks, you're probably down to around 50. And then you go out on the next phase and you know, you could come back with say 20, 25 people, which is probably a good, a good course. And then the rest of it is just training to get you ready to join, join the squadron. Um, I think for me, like I enjoyed selection. Um, like there wasn't one day when I woke up and just went, that I didn't want to be here. It was more just about, it was more just about, you know, just proving to myself that I could get through each day. And I kind of found enjoyment in seeing people fall off. I think a lot of people do, as in, not in a bad way, right? I didn't rub anyone's face in it. But when you're doing things that are difficult and you've got an easy option to get out, you can just walk off and pack your kit and go. And you'll be in a warm shower and bath and, you know, whatever food you want. So it's easy to, to quit which makes it, you know, the majority of people do quit. I think when that happens, like you, you see their weakness and it, pumps, it puts you up a level, right? It puts you up a level of, um, puts your strength up a little bit. As the less able members, the less able soldiers start to drop off, you end up with a, a tight knit, bunch of guys that have all been through the same shit and uh, you form bonds through those through those dark times you counteract it with a bit of humour at the end you're left with a good group of lads I think failure is something that you should be seeking um, because you to do anything that puts you out of your comfort zone, you're gonna fuck up every now and then. And that is, you know, that's failure, right? Um, you know, you shouldn't aim to fa fail, but, you know, failure should be a byproduct of what you're doing. Um, Cause like, I look back at some of the stuff I've done that I've, I've, you know, what you would see as my biggest failures in life. And that's where you learn the most, like, you learn the big lessons, right, from failing. Um, just like listening to myself instead of listening to other people. I think as well, like everything that you see as being hard, I think 
you know, when you start making progress, it starts opening doors, right? And then those doors open other doors and then those other doors open other doors. And, you know, in no time, you've kind of gone through different journeys and paths and ended up in places that you never thought you would do. Just start small. You've got to like be honest with yourself, right? It's your choice. Like it's your life. Like no one else is going to change it. So you've got to make that decision. You know, if you're not happy with your life and you want to change it, then then do it, right? And 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 I don't know what that is, what what anyone else is feeling, but you know, if you start small and whether it's you know you you want to get in shape, like start walking, start trying to create habits that are that are healthy for your, for your body and for your mind. You know, start walking, join a gym, join classes, put yourself in these situations. And this is where you grow, right? Because you're putting yourself in an uncomfortable situation. And my uncomfortable situation is completely different to someone else's uncomfortable situation. And, you know, you could say that a million times over. And career is like a big one, right? Like, that's the, that's the, that's the comfiest thing that people have is a career and money coming in. Because that's, you know, without money, like the chances of being homeless and not being able to pay for food for your kids and your family, like that's that's the biggest fear, right? Um, and I can't tell anyone to, to change that. You know, you've just got to ask yourself whether that's something that you want to change. We live in a normal world where people associate their skills to the job role they've got or the qualifications qualifications that they got in university or college whereas like like I've gone gone and set tasks up in certain countries that's the same as setting a business up right it's just different in a way you've just got to look for different things you've got to look for connections you've got to network um, you've got to buy assets or you know buy things in and, and, and get people to do stuff for you and that's the same in business the, the, the two are the same so it's more about just understanding what you can do as a person because it's it's way more than what you think it is. And you just get led to believe that all you can do is that nine to five or that job that you've got. Whereas actually like we live in such a world where you can just log onto a computer and learn anything that you want to learn and reskill yourself in anything. It's, it's so easy. You know, going back to what we were saying before, it's like the world's an easy place to live in. And I don't think the human body's set up to not feel struggle. You know, we've struggled all our life, right? And if you think the reason why we're all sat in these buildings and eating good food is because we struggled in the past and that struggle has generated systems and put things in place and now we've built supermarkets and cars, but that all came from struggle. So good things come from struggle, but th it's hard to find it these days. You know, it goes back to what, what I was saying before. It's like struggle could just be going for a run or struggle could be reading a book, you know, just doing something difficult like when I was that shy kid, like struggle for me was just having a conversation with someone. But like the more I do it, the better I become. You know, if you can look back when in, in 10 years and just go like, fuck, I never used to have a conversation with someone. Now I can walk into a room and speak to everyone openly and confidently. Like that's what you get from struggle, right? I think fitness and exercise is the easiest and best way to just find some sort of struggle and it's manageable right it's manageable it's easy you join a gym you go out for a run and you've got something to work for if you start running you can work up to a 5k a 10k a marathon it's measurable you've got goals that you can tick off if you're going into a gym you can start lifting heavy and you've got you've got a measurement right that you can go off that you can see yourself getting better at something sports the same like like i surf like i can feel myself every time i go surfing getting better and better and better and that's a good feeling. And then you'll notice in other areas of your life that, you know, changes will happen. And whether it's, you know, confidence or whether it's in the workplace or whether it's in a relationship or whether it's just your general happiness. Like the more of these things that you do when you're developing yourself and getting better and better, everything changes. I think if you want to go anywhere in life, you've got to make some sort of sacrifice. You know, if you think that you've got that safe, comfortable job right now, there's going to be certain things that you're going to have to sacrifice, whether it's friendships, you know, whether it's with loved ones, whether it's with family. But if you want to, if you want to live, by, live, live life by your terms, you've got to make these sacrifices. Even if you've got an excuse, you just don't say it. Because no one likes someone who uses excuses. 
It's just weakness. It sounds like you've had a career and in, them, in that career you've learnt many lessons through stories or experiences and then you're kind of putting them onto paper through your own perspective of things that you've learnt. But in terms of your career or even maybe your life, what do you think the hardest lesson you learnt was? The hardest lesson I've learnt... <laughs> Listen to yourself. Um, yeah, listen to yourself before you listen to anyone else. Um, and I'm not going to go into the story because it's it's not for for this. But um, yeah, I learned the hard way in a certain experience where I listened to some, someone else and something went wrong. Um, when I knew what I should have been doing and I should have listened to myself. Um, and you all you you, you know yourself the outcome or what, what you want the outcome to be. Um, so yeah, just listening to yourself a little bit more. Like I have to own the fact that I listen to someone else, which is even worse, which plagues you, right? But then you learn those lessons the hard way. Um, and like what you were saying, like you, you, you know yourself where you want to go, right? It's like when you ask someone their opinion of something, you already have the answer in your own head. You're just, like, you're just trying to find clarification or um, you just want them to agree with you so that you can go ahead and do it. It's important to find purpose in everything that you do, right? And that's, you know, it's as important, it's as, important as, as it is in your career or in your fitness regime or your motivation. Because um, I guess like purpose brings momentum and me personally, like if I'm not moving forward, and I'm stale, then that's like, that's my worst nightmare. You know, we're all searching for some sort of momentum and pro progress in life, and you get that from just sticking one foot in front of the other. Um, whether it's fitness, whether it's career, just keep moving forward. <laughs>